Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the webinar with uh, David Troxell. And we are going to start in just a few more minutes at 1.30. And um, we will um, enlarge our screen shortly. Okay, it is 1.30 and we are going to start. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jamie Cruz and I am the Public Education Coordinator with the Alzheimer's Society of York Region. I would also like to take this opportunity to introduce Andrea Ubel, and she is the Director of Program and Client Services with our society. And I would also like to introduce Sarah McLean, and she is our first link coordinator for the Alzheimer's Society. A few housekeeping reminders before we get started. Everyone should remain muted and keep their cameras off, please. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A as well in the comment box at the bottom of your screen. We will be watching them and hopefully at the end of the webinar, David will be able to answer all of your questions. I'd like to take a minute and acknowledge that this is being funded from our Finding Your Way through the Alzheimer's Society of Ontario. Finding Your Way is helping people live with dementia, with living with their families, their caregivers in the community and to recognize that there is risk of going missing. We want people to be prepared for when these incidences do happen and to ensure that people with dementia can live safely in the community. It is my absolute pleasure and my honor to welcome Mr. David Troxell all the way from Sacramento to provide us with his teachings behind Best Friends Approach to Care. David, who um, is also co-authored with Virginia Bell, has written six influential books about the best friend's approach to dementia care, as well as written numerous articles about dementia care, staff development, as well as training. David's not only a trainer or an educator, but David is also a family caregiver to his mother who was living with Alzheimer's disease. A quote from David's website, what people living with memory loss need most is a friend, a best friend. It is my honor to welcome David Troxell. And David, you are still muted. You know, I have to laugh because I've only done a million of these and I make that mistake 
like 50% of the time. I think they'll be adding this to future cognitive assessments, you know, along with, you know, count backwards by seven, but do you know how to unmute yourself from Zoom? Well, Jamie, thank you for that very kind introduction and to my wonderful friends and colleagues uh, in your beautiful part of the world. It's great to be with you here virtually from, from uh, the US and I will jump right in and share my screen and we will start the presentation. Well, again, thank you all very much for being part of today's webinar. We have a, a lot to pack in and a little over an hour, but I'm determined to work through the material and, and leave lots of times for questions and discussions. And just to tell you a bit more about my journey, I've been working in this field of Alzheimer's disease since 1986, when I began at the University of Kentucky Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Back then, it was only one of 10 federally funded centers in the whole country, in the whole US. And it was a very dark and challenging time. You know, back in the 1980s, uh, demographically, we were seeing more and more people uh, develop dementia. Uh, there were very few services. The, the Alzheimer's associations were in their infancy worldwide. There was a lot of stigma associated with the disease. I worked at the University of Kentucky in their Alzheimer's Center with my future best friend and writing collaborator, Virginia Bell. And it was not uncommon back then, you know, it was before the internet, uh, people would phone us at the university and want a packet of brochures and hand out some information. And I'd put these packets together. It was not uncommon for people to say, David, thank you so much. This, this conversation has been so helpful. Now, when you mail out the packet, would you, would you be sure not to put the return address on it? That they didn't want to have the word Alzheimer's in the return address. So I began that university setting working with Virginia. Uh, I worked uh, at the Alzheimer's Association in Santa Barbara, California for 10 years as their executive director. And as Jamie mentioned, I've written a series of books on dementia care and staff training and family work called The Best Friends Approach. And I'm a writer and consultant. I do a lot of work in long-term care and internationally. And so it's great to, uh, to uh, come up virtually to visit with you today. Now, I, I can't resist sharing this picture of me looking a little bit uh, uh, motley, I must say, or as my late mother would have said, a bit like a ragamuffin. I think I had stayed up very late working on a chapter that was due. But I'm pleased to let you know that just as of about two or three weeks ago, I received my Canadian passport. And thanks to my mother, who was born in Vancouver and raised in Montreal, I'm now an official dual citizen of Canada and the US. So I'm very excited about that. And uh, it took a little while to get all the paperwork done, but it was well worth it. And so hopefully I can visit you again uh, post pandemic as a uh, fellow Canadian, not just as a, a interloper from the United States. So in today's class, um, we're going to offer a, a lot to pack in because, you know, when Jamie and the society and Andrea and everybody asked me to put the presentation together, I, I always try to do something special for the Canadians. So we'll have a brief overview of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias and talk about the importance of keeping the person living with dementia active and engaged. I'll, of course, introduce the best friend's philosophy of care. I'm going to kind of take a little bit of a case study approach today and talk to you about a dear friend of mine, Daphne Gormley, no longer with us, but she had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's in her 50s, uh, lived in Santa Barbara when I lived there. And she was one of these people you meet that really changes your life and changes my view of dementia. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about her. We'll discuss the importance and power of empathy, good communication, life story work, activities and behavior. So lot, lots to do. And I think, I think we'll make it through together. I hope so. Okay. Uh, I always like to start my presentations with a bit of history, and if we were all together in the same room, I would ask you how many of you had ever seen a, a picture of this man here, Dr. Alzheimer. He's the man who started this whole thing off. He was apparently a, a very well-regarded and well-liked physician practicing in Germany in the early part of the 1900s, and he had a fascination back then. You know, you think about this era being kind of a birth time of psychiatry, he had a fascination with behavior, with what they would have called back then lunacy. You know, what causes this type of lunacy? Is it something in the air and the water? Is it witchcraft? What is it? Well, well, Dr. Alzheimer was a very progressive thinker and he thought there was a link between the brain and behavior, which of course we now know is true. 
And, and here's a woman that he, he met uh, that kind of changed the, the course of medical history. She's not the first person to ever have Alzheimer's disease. We, we know this disease has been with us, I'm sure, forever. But she's the first woman described as having Alzheimer's disease, Augusta. And she was a housewife. She was only 51. Today, we would call this a younger onset person. <clears throat> but in an odd twist of fate, she was much younger. And she came to Dr. Alzheimer that her husband brought her in. And she was having problems with everyday tasks, you know, burning things on the stove. Uh, she was getting lost in familiar neighborhoods, having trouble with words and language. She had something called delusions, which are fixed false ideas. Well, we'll talk more about those in a minute. But primarily, she was having memory issues. And she even tells Dr. Alzheimer, because we actually have his case study, his clinical notes. Uh, this is where we got her picture from. Uh, he, she tells Dr. Alzheimer, I have lost myself. So very, very powerful. And I, I want you just to take a moment. I know some of you are probably watching this uh, webinar on your phones even, but if you have hopefully a decent computer screen, just take a look at her face, you know? And I, I have to say that when you look at this face, I, I see a lot of loss and disconnection, uh, malnutrition, sadness. She certainly to me looks older than 51. And, you know, I think part of my mission in, in life is to try to change this face of Alzheimer's. Um, we know this is the face of Alzheimer's even today. Certainly there are people toward the end of their lives or in skilled nursing who, who are, are having a pretty tough time. But I think there is a lot we can do, as I'm going to hope to present in this, this one hour here, to kind of lift the person up and have them really be at their best and, and maybe change this, this face of dementia from Augusta to something else. So um, I want to just kind of reflect on a few things related to healthcare and kind of our research situation right now. And then I promise we'll get right into uh, how you can sort of develop some effective caregiving tools. But, you know, I think it's sobering to take a look at this slide here, uh, at least for the United States Food and Drug Administration approval of medications. And when you look at the first four, these are the current approved drugs in the US, and I'm guessing probably approved in Canada as well. Aricept, Exelon, and Razodine are what we call cholinesterase inhibitors. They, they, are, they kind of give those neurotransmitters in the brain a bit of a boost. Uh, Nemenda uh, is an old German drug now approved in the US for all of the stages of dementia. Taken with one of the first three, it seems to have some neuroprotective qualities. But the, these four medicines, are not actually a treatment for Alzheimer's. They don't truly stop the underlying course of illness. They're not what we would call disease modifying. They seem to help with symptoms a bit. So we really need something much, much better. There is a, a new drug under consideration, aducanumab, uh, by a company called Biogen. But uh, if this drug is even approved, and it, it's kind of had a lot of ups and downs, uh, the latest FDA panel review of outside consultants was pretty negative but it would probably be something that uh, wouldn't really help all that much, my point of view. It might help some early stage people taking it much earlier, it's an infusion, uh, but we need to do much better. And so when I look at this, I think the key is to look to your right and see the approval dates. It has now been, I think, 18 years, maybe 19 years since we've had a new FDA approved drug for Alzheimer's disease. And, and there's just no way to put it. This is a, a debacle. It really is a debacle. We've struggled so much to get a better drug. Now, there is hopefulness on the way. In fact, a colleague and friend of mine, Dr. Jeff Cummings, probably one of the top 10 um, neurologists in the world, he says he's never been more optimistic. In the US right now, there's something like 34,000 people in clinical trials. There's about 191 clinical trials underway, many of them with some innovations. I think 20 to 25% of them are in phase three clinical trials. So again, lots of good news ahead. But what is the treatment for Alzheimer's disease right now? I'm going to say to you that it's really you and me. It's, it's creating a therapeutic healing environment. It's socialization. It's engagement. Uh, unfortunately, we don't really have a medicine for Alzheimer's right now. So I'm not going to take a lot of time here because I'm sure the uh, Canadian Society and, and, and your wonderful resources in your area have lots of good material on this. But just a quick kind of recap of Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is the leading cause of dementia, and I'll define that word in a minute. The average course of illness is about eight years, but 
one thing I've written about with my colleague, Virginia Bell, you, you know, you've kind of met one person with Alzheimer's, you, you've met one person with Alzheimer's, and some people seem to kind of crash through these stages and in three or four years, some people live with it for 20 years, but on average, about eight years, it is progressive, rather slow moving. My mother's late, my mother's neurologist, my mother passed away in, in 2008. My mother's neurologist said that my mom's dementia was like a slow and lazy river. Again, kind of an image of dementia. Key symptoms, short-term memory loss, confusion, mistakes. Alzheimer's, sadly, we, we have to be clear, it is in many ways a fatal illness because of some of the uh, issues that are caused by Alzheimer's. You have a greater risk for falls, for infection. And according to, again, Dr. Cummings, who's so well regarded when I heard him speak last year, he said that the number one cause of death for people with Alzheimer's is actually aspiration pneumonia. So we can see this is a challenge. Now, on the right, you'll, you'll see something I like to throw into my presentations. You know, trying to kind of fight some of the stigma out there because, you know, I, I got a question uh, a few weeks ago on a webinar, David, when will my mother enter the angry stage? <laughs> and, you know, hopefully never, I suppose it could happen. But, you know, it, it's a myth that everybody with Alzheimer's is sort of combative or violent or disagreeable. My, my late mother, Dorothy, was sort of pleasantly confused and really had mostly good days. But it is true that some people with dementia may have agitation, paranoia, combativeness, make false accusations. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about those issues, but uh, it, it can be, of course, a tremendously challenging situation. Now, I know many of you on this webinar today are family members, and I assume some of you may be pretty new to this. So I want you to take a moment and, and really study the slide here because it's, it's powerful. Um, one of the challenges with dementia is that we can't see it. You know, if I had a, a broken arm right now, you could you could see the cast. You could you could see my my broken arm, and you would know I can't play tennis with you this afternoon or go golfing. But when when the brain is broken, we we don't always see it. And and so sometimes family members, you know, their parent or their husband, wife, or partner gets dementia, and and they they keep trying to do things the way they've always done them, and argue and correct and reason. And, and the truth is that with this, this disease, everything changes. And we have to pivot as a care partner, as a caregiver. We have to pivot and, and try some different approaches, in a sense, what I'll talk about in a minute with the best friends approach. But, but let's, let's look at this slide again. On the left, this is something called a PET scan that, that looks at how the brain uses glucose or sugar, simply put. And on the left, you see a healthy brain. And perhaps you're talking to this person and you're saying, you know, name as many many cities as you can in Canada or name the provinces of Canada or you know, name, uh, name uh, animals in a zoo. And you can see the brain is all lit up and doing such a beautiful job. On the right, this PET scan is sort of a real time study. Maybe you're asking somebody to name animals in a zoo and you see they're saying, you know, ch they're saying, you know, uh, you know, elephant, tiger, turtle, you know, monkey. And then they go back to elephant, tiger, monkey, elephant. They might just name four or five things in a few minutes. So you can see whole areas of the brain are, are not lit up. And this is why I think it's so powerful to have empathy and we wanna really walk a mile in the shoes of the person with dementia and know that they can't do the things they've always done. Now, again, one of my goals of this presentation is to give you uh, some snapshots here and there of important information. And I love this particular slide uh, lent to me by Dr. Michael McLeod at the University of California Davis uh, Alzheimer's Center. And I think it's very clever that he says, Alzheimer's disease doesn't travel alone, doesn't travel alone. Alzheimer's disease, and of course, many of the other dementias often come with treatable challenges, treatable things, but that if we miss them or leave them untreated, everything gets worse. So on the right, you can see all of these things that, you know, sometimes accompany Alzheimer's, inappropriate medications. Of course, particularly if people are living by themselves, even if you give them that pill box or the pill organizer, they're probably taking everything wrong, or maybe they're taking a lot of over-the-counter medications that, that really aren't good for the brain. Uh, alcohol can be an issue, stroke, depression, and pain. I'll talk about that more in a minute, but those are two kind of classic things that are treatable most often, uh, but if we miss them, it can really lower a person's cognition. Malnutrition, hormone issues, blood sugar, diabetes. This has been an area 
has captured some attention of researchers in recent years. Uh, we, we believe now that people, particularly with uncontrolled diabetes, high levels of blood sugar who aren't taking care of themselves, that that is an enemy of the brain and can worsen cognition. Hearing, visual impairment, vitamin B12, D deficiencies, sleep issues, a lot of interesting work being done now about what we call sleep hygiene, uh, how someone sleeps. And, and we believe that having a good night's sleep is actually very powerful for brain health. And then this last bit here, I'm kind of proud of, of Dr. McLeod as a physician for throwing this into the list because you know sometimes doctors are very focused on the medical model, but he mentions loneliness and isolation. And this is particularly relevant right now with the pandemic as we know that people with Alzheimer's have been disproportionately impacted with morbidity and mortality. Uh, in the States, I think a recent study said that 50,000 people with Alzheimer's disease died in the last year who would not have otherwise died uh, due to the pandemic. And it's not because they all caught COVID. I think a lot of it is the isolation and loneliness that has damaged their overall well-being and health. So again, keep this in mind if you're a caregiver, you want to watch for things that are treatable. And I used that analogy earlier from my mother's doctor, Dr. Robert Harbaugh in Santa Barbara. You see Alzheimer's is like that slow and lazy river. Remember that if there's a sudden change, you know, if, if mother's pleasantly confused, all is going well, but one day, boom, she's not, well, that typically means she's ill or in pain or something's happened. And that's when you want to consult with your physician. Now, let me take a moment now and just kind of cover briefly depression and then next pain. But depression is a pretty fascinating subject when it comes to the world of dementia. Uh, there's actually research dating back to 1952 that people with long histories of clinical depression might be at a greater risk for cognitive illness. And it does seem that many people with Alzheimer's disease have been depressed and many people with Alzheimer's are depressed. So I want you to be aware of this because depression is treatable in most cases, either with medicine or with engagement and activity. So some signs of depression include persistent sadness, excessive worry, frequent tearfulness, feeling worthless or helpless, loss of appetite, weight changes, difficulty sleeping, difficulty concentrating, withdrawal from activities. But simply put, particularly for you family members, I think you can sense it when, when you see it. Now, there is a, a scale that actually I think anybody could use. It's, I think it's in the public domain as well, Cornell University's scale for depression and dementia. You can Google it, and it can be actually something you could even do at home or as a professional in your care setting, whether you're in a day center, in-home, or residential care. Next, I want to talk about something that, that kind of breaks my heart, but pain is often unreported <clears throat> or underreported in people with dementia. Now, let's take a moment and, and think about this. You see, if I develop a bad toothache, maybe tomorrow, tomorrow is Saturday, I wake up and I, I'm in, in agony. You know, I have a, a clearly an infection going on in my tooth. I mean, things are not good. You see, I can, I can call my dentist even on a Saturday and maybe I'll get an emergency dental clinic phone number. And even though it might cost me plenty of money to go to an emergency dentist, I can probably get it taken care of over the weekend. But you see, if a person with Alzheimer's disease develops a toothache, he or she may not be able to say, uh, nurse, nurse, um, my tooth hurts. I think I'm getting some kind of infection. I need to see a dentist. And instead, they just kind of live with that pain. They just experience that pain. And, and you know, a very contemporary view of dementia is that people with dementia are in so many ways just like the rest of us with all the same needs, feelings, emotions. How do any of us do when we are in pain? you know, not well, we, we don't wanna go out, we don't wanna eat, we wanna stay in bed, we're, we're grumpy, we're agitated, maybe we're even angry. Same is true for people with dementia. So if you see uh, your family member or client or resident and you notice some labored breathing, some negative vocalization, you know, ooh, ah, oh, you know, calling out facial expression, grimaces, just some body languages, tightness, and I think there's a very good word, consolability. If you, know, if you give them their favorite strawberry ice cream cone, it doesn't seem to cheer them up or comforting words, suspect pain. Another very good tool, pain AD tool. Uh, again, it's something you can look up on the web. It's in the public domain. Anybody can administer this or take a look at it. It can help you figure out if you need to 
go to the physician. Now, one little tip that a geriatrician friend of mine told me is that if you can't figure out, if you, if you can't figure out really what's going on with mom and dad about pain, you know, maybe try some extended release Tylenol or some over-the-counter uh, analgesic because maybe it is their chronic pain around arthritis or joints or other things like that. A couple other little health tips before I dive into best friends. Uh, I just want to say words about a few words about psychotropic or the psychiatric medications. Um, and I love this picture here. And I guess I'll set up my slide by saying, you know, what do you think helps this resident living in memory care, in this case in South San Francisco? What do you think helps her when she's having a bad day? Uh, powerful psychotropic med or Sophie the St. Bernard? And, and I hope you, you all agree the St. Bernard's doing pretty well by her. But again, if someone's having behavior, you know, you want to you wanna do so many things before you turn to meds. Look for behavioral environmental issues, enough lighting, if, if there's too much noise or background things happening, uh, because psych medicines have significant side effects, a greater risk for falling down, a greater risk for infection. Uh, we'll talk more about, you know, behavioral management in a minute, but basically uh, psych meds should hopefully be your second choice. They don't work all that well with big side effects. So if you do need to use them, be judicious, go low, start slow, evaluate on a regular basis. Hugs can often be better than drugs. Now, I promised you this definition a little bit earlier, so let me keep my word about this. And throughout my talk today, I've tried to add a little bit of expertise from some of my Canadian friends who work in the field of dementia. Here's one, Carol Bowlby Sifton, who I believe currently lives in Nova Scotia. Uh, I think a very distinguished nurse and educator about Alzheimer's. And Carol has this great analogy about, you know, what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? Well, she says dementia is kind of like the word soup, okay? And we think about the word soup. There's dozens of soup, chicken noodle, tomato, clam chowder, right? Well, every clam chowder is a soup, but not every soup is clam chowder. If, if you go into a restaurant, you say, waiter, what is the soup of the day? Okay, so similar with Alzheimer's, you know, you see there's lots of dementias. There's Alzheimer's, there's Lewy body, there's vascular dementia. If you go to the doctor and the doctor says, your mother has dementia, you wanna say, doctor, what kind? What is the soup of the day? What is the dementia of the day? Again, every Alzheimer's disease is a dementia, but not every dementia is Alzheimer's. So just a nice little kind of way of thinking about this important uh, topic. So let me transition now after just sharing a little bit about some of the health aspects about Alzheimer's disease and these other dementias. Again, you can find lots of good information, I'm sure on the US and Canadian websites about uh, Alzheimer's and different dementias. But what now? You know, maybe some of you have just received a diagnosis for yourselves, maybe uh, your family member. Uh, well, a couple of things. If you are starting this path of, of dementia, get your legal and financial affairs in order. Again, forgive me, I don't know all the Canadian uh, terminology, but in the US, you, know, you wanna have a good power of attorney for healthcare and finances and your estate plan done, because eventually the person with dementia will lose that competency. And this is a mistake that I often see, honestly, in some of the best caregivers who are so diligent, but they think they can do it all themselves. So don't fall into that trap. You know, be aware of what's out there. Don't wait and wait to use services, as I hope I can convince you shortly. Uh, socialization is so important. And if you keep the person at home, just you and them uh, by yourselves, I think sometimes that can really isolate the person and drag you down from the exhaustion and challenges of caregiving. So, so make a game plan and, and dip your toes in, try some of these programs, take care of yourself. And of course, learn as much as you can so you can become a skilled partner. There is a right way and a wrong way. There's a right way and a wrong way to approach this task of caregiving. And, and I hope I can give you some examples about how when we pivot and, and try some different things, uh, a lot of good things can happen in terms of care. Now, the best friends approach to dementia care, this is Virginia and I a couple of years ago in uh, Chicago. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about our history. Uh, we, I was hired in 1986, seems like a century ago. I guess it was. <laughs> I was, uh, I was uh, hired in 1986 to be the outreach coordinator for the then new University of Kentucky Alzheimer's Center. I think I was 26 years old. And that's where I met Virginia Bell, who had just turned 60 and gotten her MSW. We've, we've become almost lifelong friends now in many ways. 
and writers and collaborators. And we were the only two kind of non bench scientists in this rather large center. And so we were charged with running around the state of Kentucky doing webinars or not webinars, right? Doing seminars and doing uh, uh, talks and holding support groups. And, and we were very um, amazed at the turnout at all these support groups. People were hungry for information, but we didn't have a lot of answers for them. If they said, David, this is again, back in the 1980s, David, you know, I, I have mother at home. I have young children at home. What do I do if, if mother with dementia runs out the front door and my children run out the back door? Who do I go after? You know, what, what do I do if, if my husband's aggressive? What do I do? So Virginia had started one of the first adult day programs in the U.S. for people with Alzheimer's disease called the Helping Hand. And this is where we began formulating our ideas about Alzheimer's care. Now, the Day Center Virginia opened, and I, I joined shortly after we began growing the Day Center. This was a very fascinating thing. We, we created this adult day center primarily with volunteers for people with dementia who were coming to the University of Kentucky Memory, Memory Disorder Clinic, and their own families were struggling. People would drop grandmother or mother off at the day center and say, David in Virginia, she won't do this. She can't do this. <clears throat> She's impossible. She, she fights me all day long. And, and we recognize that many of these people coming to our day center with Alzheimer's disease had all these feelings on the left. You know, when you're, when you're losing cognition and memory and thinking, it's easy to fall into the situation of loss, isolation and loneliness, sadness, confusion, worry, anxiety, frustration, fear, all of these things, right? But what we did is we began creating what I like to call kind of a therapeutic environment, an environment that's healing. And we had so many different things we were doing, almost really just by accident. We, we didn't really know what we were doing back then, but we started out by doing a pretty extensive life story on everybody in the program. We, we tried to learn about, you know, maybe we had a new client or participant in the day program and she was a nurse and she'd worked uh, with children and she'd won the nurse of the year award several times. And we tried to imagine, you know, what would a nurse like to do? Well, maybe have a clipboard and maybe help us plan the schedule and make rounds. So we tried to understand people's unique social histories and life stories. By the way, we recruited volunteers and we assigned the volunteers to work one-on-one -on -one with one of the participants and then work as a group. So the volunteers were called best friends and we matched them to participants. We featured art, music, exercise, good food and conversation, activity and engagement. We, we made this a joyful place. Now, again, back in the 1980s, we thought of this program initially as strictly a respite program for families to give them a break, okay? But the strangest thing began happening. These clients at the day center whose own families had almost given up on them, they began to have a delightful day. Uh, the participants uh, were thriving and the families would come in and say, oh my gosh, how come she's doing this for you and she won't do this for me? And, and are you giving her some Kentucky bourbon? <laughs> What's going on, right? And, and that's where we kind of have as Oprah Winfrey, dare I quote an American uh, legend, Oprah Winfrey would say a light bulb moment, these light bulb moments that, you know, maybe something that we are doing, even though this program is just for respite, is actually proving to be therapeutic and is actually making a difference. And this was sort of the beginning of our sense that as a caregiver, we could strategize and do some things to really create success. And so in fact, we came to understand that when you, when you, in our case, be a best friend to the person with dementia, when you surround them with, with joyful activity, engagement, music, art, exercise, when you keep them busy, when you converse with them, we could begin moving them from left to right, from loss to fulfillment, confusion to orientation, paranoia to trust. Now, this obviously isn't necessarily permanent. It's kind of like putting pearls on a string. You have to kind of keep this thing going. But over time, it's incredible how we began to see that this was having a powerful impact. And we also noticed, by the way, that when our volunteers would say, well, hello, Luann, uh, it's David. I, I'm, I'm your best friend today. It's so good to see you. That there was something about that word friendship that you could just see the people with dementia taking a deep breath and soaking this in, that it was somehow very, very therapeutic. Now, interestingly enough, Virginia and I, we had a boss at the University of Kentucky, 
And he was a world famous neurologist named Bill Marksbury. And he was kind of our mentor and our hero. We, we idolized him back then. But he was a very, uh, I don't want to necessarily say aloof, but he was a very um, serious, shy man, a brilliant researcher. And he, he had, you know, he was, it was almost like visiting the Pope really to, to make an audience with Dr. Marksbury. So one day we were, we were working at our center and Dr. Marksbury phoned and said, you know, I have never come by the center, you know, I want to come by and see it. And we were rather nervous because he was our boss. And I don't think he'd even really understood that we'd launched this whole day center. So Dr. Marksbury came again, this sort of heroic, highly revered person. And he walked into the adult day program uh, and he said, you know, David and Virginia, I have 10 minutes. Okay. Would you believe Dr. Marksbury stayed two and a half hours? He danced the hokey pokey with Elna. He served ice cream cones. He went for a walk with the day center participants. Now, virtually all of these people at our day center were his own patients because we recruited at the UK, University of Kentucky Memory Disorder Clinic. And that's where he practiced, right? He was seeing his own patients doing all these extraordinary things and, and he just couldn't believe it. When he left that day, he said to Virginia and me, he said, you know, Virginia and David, my God, this program, this program, this day program, what you're doing, this is the treatment for Alzheimer's disease. So again, uh, very interesting kind of framework for this whole best friends approach. And, and so from the day center, Virginia and I began writing, uh, writing about human rights, writing about activities, about communication. And we wrote our first book called The Best Friends Approach to Alzheimer's Care that came out in the mid 1990s. And we argued that, you know, as tough as Alzheimer's is, and, and my own mother, you know, died with Alzheimer's, there were a lot of sad moments for sure. As tough as it is, I think we want to move away from some of the victimization and negativity and, and try to say, well, how can I survive this as a family member? How can I, how can I somehow travel this journey and at the end feel, feel pretty good about what I've done? And so we would argue that a lot of this is adopting what we call the best friends approach, uh, namely that what a person with dementia needs is a friend, is a best friend. Now, when we think about friendship, you know, I, I have many friends. I know many of you do as well. Of course, friendship is multicultural. You, you don't have to have a PhD to have a friend. You don't have to speak English or French to have a friend, right? It's worldwide. Well, with our friends, we have empathy. You know, if I have coffee with a friend of mine and he says, you know, David, forgive me, I'm not at my best, I have a terrible migraine. Well, let's say my friend is sort of short-tempered with me and irritable. Well, I'm, I'm gonna let it go because I know he's having, he's in pain, he has a migraine, right? And so similar with, with dementia, we, we wanna understand that maybe they're not their best, we have empathy for their experience. And we always wanna realize that when problems happen, it's the disease, not the person. Friends know each other quite well. You know, I know what friends of mine I would throw a surprise party for, and I know what friends of mine would never forgive me, never speak to me again if I had a surprise party for them, right? So we know our friends well. We know their preferences, what kind of foods they eat, what their, what their attitudes are. And so we want to know the person with dementia equally well. In fact, it's even more important because they are forgetful. And we want to, we want to cue them about their successes and past and you know, uh, bring them their coffee with two sugars and two creams, just the way they like it, and, and, and be that memory. So a best friend's approach, again, involves empathy and kindness and warmth, but also knowing and using that life story. Friends talk to each other. They text, they email, they chit chat. And so we know the language centers of the brain where people with dementia is badly damaged, but still people with dementia have a desire to still connect and communicate. So again, uh, a best friend communicates. We want to bring this communication strategy into dementia care. And of course, friends are encouraging. Maybe you have a friend who's lost their job during this pandemic. We want to say to them, you know, you're a talented accountant. There's lots of opportunities open up. Be hopeful. You're going to get a great new job. And we want to be supportive and encouragement of, encouraging of people with dementia as well. And of course, friends do things together. So again, activities and engagement. I hope you can begin to sort of see how we can be a, a best friend to this person with dementia. This picture on the left is one of my favorites. I actually haven't used it for quite a, quite a while now. But it's from about, gosh, almost 20 years ago now in Seattle. Uh, the woman on, on the right has Alzheimer's, and that's her daughter on the left. 
and I have permission to use these photos. And uh, I said to the woman on the right, I said, you know, I really like your hat. And she said to me, well, thank you, dear. And I said to her, do you enjoy wearing a hat? And she said, oh, yes, dear. When a lady wears a hat, everybody treats you better. So again, this art of conversation, being delightful, being in the moment. And of course, I love the fact they have a little tea party going. It was actually taken in assisted living with these old rituals of a hat and a tea, cup of tea, very, very charming. Now, I want you to meet a pretty extraordinary person, someone who really uh, changed my life in many ways, having met her and worked with her even just a little bit. Uh, Daphne Gormley, who I met in Santa Barbara when I was the executive director of the Alzheimer's Association there. Daphne was a scientist and an optician who worked on the Hubble Space Telescope, and she was only 59 when she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Now, again, imagine having this high-powered career and, and having to leave it, because what happened is she began making subtle mistakes at work. Um, you know, Many of us who don't work in highly technical fields, if we made little mistakes here and there, people might not even notice, but if you're a, a rocket scientist, everything has to be perfect. So she began making these small mistakes at work. They did a investigation, they had her you know, worked up in a medical profession, and sure enough, she received a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, again, at this very young age. Now, I have to tell you, I think I'd be furious at the universe that this happened to me. And you think about all the years of education she undertook to have this job that she loved. Uh, she was pretty much, you know, walked out the door when forced into early retirement. Um, I think it'd be very devastating. But Daphne was quite something. And she was such an optimistic soul. She said, you know, one door closes, another one opens. Um, I'm going to try to turn my attention to something that I've always loved and not had time to do, art. And um, she said that rather than limiting my artwork, my Alzheimer's seems to have unleashed a whole new area of creativity for me. And so she found something very therapeutic and positive that she could you know, do with her art. Uh, again, she lived in Santa Barbara, which is right along the coastline in California. She loved to paint outdoor scenes. And I want you now to see one of her paintings. And I'm gonna set it up by telling you that, you know, again, she lived by the ocean. She liked to paint things like lighthouses. This particular piece, though, is quite fascinating because she said, David, on the left is me before Alzheimer's disease, and on the right is me after. And I think you'll agree it's pretty interesting. So on the left, you see um, a very orderly scene of all the black and white squares kind of nicely, you know, kind of tied together. On the right, you sort of see this jumbled set of squares and rectangles. Uh, you have a house on the left, you have what might be a hand or a sunshine. So, you know, I'm, I, I know our time is short, but maybe you can all just put in the chat box even for a minute if you'd like. What do you, any, any comments about what you think the difference is between left and right? On the left, David, is before, before Alzheimer's, on the right is after. What, what do you think Daphne's trying to say? How do you feel about the emotion between left and right? Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing for just a moment and see if anyone would like to put it in their chat box for a second and give me, you can all be art critics for a moment. Emotion versus confusion, happiness then sadness. And there's no wrong answers. Order versus confusion, some jumbled thoughts, differences. Oh my goodness, lots of differences, structure. Right side shows a little bit more carefree. Order on the left, the right things are mixed up, but there is sunshine. In control, out of control, disorganized, jumbled, distortion. Who knew we had a great art, art crew here? The lighthouse is brighter on the right. Happy but confused. Distortion. Terrific. Okay, I will, I will go back to sharing my screen here, although we can keep adding these here. And let me tell you what Daphne told me. Daphne said, you know, David, I meant this scene to be humorous. I meant it to be playful. Daphne said, David, my spice rack used to be alphabetized 
but now I'm trying to let go. I'm trying to have more fun. I'm trying to relax. So again, a, a little bit of interesting work here around art therapy as well. The next slide, I just kind of threw in for a bit of fun, but just to remind you about the creativity. And in fact, there's an incredible researcher at University of California, San Francisco named Bruce Miller, who studied people with frontal temporal dementia. Uh, and he actually has scanned the brains of people who have started doing art, who've never done art before, and of artists who get dementia and begin and continue to paint. And Dr. Miller feels that actually people with Alzheimer's or frontal temporal dementia might actually have spikes in creativity. So here's another scene Daphne did where she began a series painting various Catholic saints. Now Daphne had long left the church, but later in life, maybe she was searching for some spiritual connection and meaning, and she began painting these incredibly vivid and interesting colors and schemes of the various Catholic saints. So again, let's just sort of think about, you know, me setting this up for the best friends approach for Daphne. Uh, imagine that some of you have an assisted living home you work at or a day center, your in-home providers, or maybe Daphne is your aunt and suddenly she comes to live with you. How could we practice this, this best friends approach with Daphne? Well, here, by the way, this is probably gonna shock a few of you, are the plaques and tangles in her brain that Daphne painted. How about that? So in Daphne's case, how can we be a best friend to her? Well, I think keeping it real, keeping it authentic. If Daphne wants to talk about her Alzheimer's diagnosis, which often she'd like to talk about, she, she was someone who was aware of, of what was going on, um, rather than just trying to negate her feelings and cheer her up, you know, she would, say, she would like it. We say, Daphne, I, I'm sorry you're having a tough day. Tell me more about it. How are you feeling? It must be tough to lose some of the memory but I, I'm sure happy to be with you right now, Daphne. I, I enjoy being your friend. Uh, when you learn Daphne's life story, there's suddenly a lot to work with. And one recommendation I have for many of you uh, on the call, professionals and families, you know, if you uh, enroll your mother in an assisted living building or a day program, they often have a, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight page social history form where you know, a good dementia program will try to understand who your mom or dad is and has been. Well, I, I have to tell you, I, I kind of like to simplify these days and I like to just create a little top 10 card, you know, 10 important things about my mom, 10 important things about me. Because that way, if you have a new staff member working in assisted living or maybe a new in-home worker, they can just take a quick look at this top 10 card and get some immediate ideas. Now, for those of you at home, create this top 10 card because what if your mom or dad has to go to the ER or something like that? It's a great tool. So here's Daphne. She worked at NASA on the Space Telescope. She's an engineer and optician. She's a PhD, but call her Daphne. She likes coffee, milk, and sugar. She's affectionate and funny, loves animals, loves the ocean and beaches, enjoys being social, loves painting and doing art. She likes her science magazines. And oh my goodness, maybe even some old vintage science fiction TV shows, right? So again, if I'm a new person coming to work with her, I can go to number four and say, oh, Miss Daphne, or Daphne, I brought you a coffee with lots of milk and sugar, just the way you like it, here you go. And you see instantly Daphne will feel like she knows me and I know her. And, and you see when the person with dementia has a sense of trust and connection, everything goes better, right? Now, how can you use this? Again, talk about her career and the excitement of working in the space program, your ritual love of animals, coffee, talk about the ocean and beaches. Maybe uh, you get on streaming services, old episodes of Star Trek or some fun you know, sci-fi shows, humor, small group discussion, of course, start an art project together. All of these things, invite her to show you her science magazines, all of these things. Life story work can be so powerful. Again, for those of you who work, for example, in residential care, let's say you have a resident who wants to leave the, the building and maybe it's 10 degrees outside and snowing, right? Maybe the resident says, I'm late for work, I'm late for work, I've got to go. Well, if you know nothing about the person, how do you redirect them away from the door? It's really hard. If it were Daphne, you could say, Daphne, before you go to work, oh my goodness, I, I'd love to just talk to you a bit more about science. I, I think you know the bus isn't quite here yet. Would, would you show me those beautiful magazines that you have your articles in? Uh, let's take a look at those. And you see, you can sort of more skillfully redirect her from the screen. Communication. Again, I mentioned earlier that the language centers of the brain are, are damaged by Alzheimer's, but people with dementia still have a, a need to communicate, a desire to communicate. 
So just a few basics here related to Daphne in general, slow down, speak up, make eye contact. I love giving the person with dementia lots of hopefully heartfelt compliments. Um, oh, Dorothy, you look so beautiful today in that pretty pink sweater. Oh, Daphne, thanks to you, you've opened up the universe to all of us. You are an inspiration. How much time does a compliment take? A minute? How much money does it cost? It's free. But you see, you give a compliment and it lifts someone up and maybe, maybe you'll get a compliment back. Uh, give simple choices. It helps her feel in control. Um, Daphne, do you want to wear the red sweater today or the blue sweater? Uh, don't ask too many questions. If you, if you don't know much about her and you're asking lots of questions, <clears throat> it can cause frustration. And you see the person with dementia knows they still should know. So you don't want to say now, Daphne, how many children do you have and what are their names and where do they live? Because it, it might reinforce her losses. Um, fill in the blanks, give her cues and clues, all that's good. And of course, this last one, particularly for those of you who are family members, uh, you know, it's so important to remember, don't, don't constantly argue or correct. It's hard to break those old cycles. I think it's fine to gently cue somebody, you know, about something once or twice. But, you know, if, if they think President Clinton is still the president of the U.S., you might want to say, I like him too, not try to argue and say who the new president is. Now, when we think about communication, I'm very touched by this quote from the famed poet Maya Angelou. And Maya certainly did not write this about Alzheimer's, but I think it's so relevant for what we're doing. Uh, Maya wrote that I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And so again, this is powerful with, with dementia care share your heart, share your feelings. Um, recently, I consulted with a family who couldn't get grandmother out of her house. Grandmother was very unsafe. They really wanted her to move to an assisted living memory care program. And one thing they were doing was explaining, 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 arguing, 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 total, total cognitive world. And I advised them, I said, hey, you know, really, uh, you want to be sharing more with your heart, your emotion. Grandmother, we want you to be living near us. This is a beautiful home. We love you. We're worried about you. You know, share more of that heart and emotion and, and people with dementia will remember this. And one, uh, I think, quick point about this quote that I think is very important, you know, probably the hardest thing if you're a family member is when your mother, and it does happen, she may forget exactly who you are, you know, and, and it's, it's so painful if you can imagine your mother not remembering you. Well, this happens for obvious reasons. And, you know, People don't know how old they are and where they are, and they get mixed up about you know, people, family members looking alike. But I think the healing part of this is that even if my mother can't remember that I'm David, her son, I think she retains that emotional memory of me that I'm, I'm someone special. Again, a few ideas here. Uh, best friends approach for Daphne. Write out a conversation starter card to share with your staff or build this into your program. Um, design one for each person. Daphne, what was your favorite part about growing up in Santa Barbara? Uh, what was the most exciting part about working for NASA? I often find that even when short-term memory fails, long-term memories are intact. And so, you know, sometimes you just have to trigger somebody and they'll tell you the same old story that they love telling. And this can be very pleasurable for the person with dementia. And of course, be supportive. You know, some of my favorite things I like to say, you know, Daphne, I'm here for you. It's good to be your friend. What would I do without you, Dad? Thanks for being our teacher. You are the most accomplished person I know. And these, by the way, can also be very lovely late stage dementia when someone's maybe lost a lot of their communication skills just to be holding their hand and saying some of these warm, comforting words with, for them as well. Now, I'm not gonna take a lot of time on this slide because of our, our time constraints today, but let me just get these all up here. Yeah, one more, maybe yes. So I want you to meet in this slide, the treatment for Alzheimer's disease, okay? Notice you don't see microscopes and pills and scans and technical slides. The treatment for Alzheimer's disease and these other dementias is really socialization. The brain loves company, right? And so you wanna build these things into your day, creative activities, conversation, the life story, People with dementia exercise, uh, 
uh, exercise has now been shown with our research about prevention. We think that people who exercise regularly may get Alzheimer's disease later in life than people who don't. And if you have Alzheimer's and you exercise, it may slow down the disease process. So I, I want you to try to get mother up and moving twice a day, if at all possible. Uh, music, we know, lives in the brain in a different place than words and language. Music's very therapeutic. You know, get some of those Amazon devices or Google devices so you can kind of have that instant music service. Uh, laughter, art, learning and growth, teaching classes on things, you know, going on the internet, all of that's very valuable. And even though I know it's cold up in your part of the world today, being out of doors, particularly when the weather gets a bit better, I think it's so spiritual and healing and full of that natural vitamin D. Now, again, in my kind of potpourri hodgepodge presentation today, I did wanna say a little bit about dementia-related behavior because certainly I don't wanna gloss over the fact that there can be some tough days as well. And, and, and you know, I wanna just again say, there's a phrase we use in the field, you know, behavior communicates a message. And a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times, if we get creative and think about behavior and use the best friends approach and you know, try to make sure they're not in pain or depressed or other issues are going on, they don't have a urinary tract infection, we can often uh, address some of these challenging behaviors. So here's just a couple quick examples and maybe we'll have some time in our discussion. But Patricia was an early client of the adult day program in Kentucky. Uh, an amazing person. She was an incredibly talented folk artist. She'd paint these incredible paintings and drawings of African-American women in this beautiful hats and, and outfits. And she was an artist. She was a church lady, very active in his church. But part of her dementia, she had some damage to the language centers and she would cry out. You know, she'd go, ah, ah. And she'd do this in the small day program and as you can imagine, it was kind of disruptive and some of the other clients at the day center would get mad, like, shut up and why are you doing that? Well, in a lesser program, you know, the staff might have gotten together and said, oh, you know, Patricia's family, oh, she's just too disruptive. We can't handle her. We've got to discharge her. Well, not Virginia Bell and not the day program. They're very creative. So they delved into her life story and they said, what makes her happy? What helps her focus? And they discovered that when she was doing her art, or listening to church music, no vocalization. So again, we kept her busy with the things she enjoyed. Masaka was from Japan uh, in Lexington, Kentucky, where we had the day program, uh, where we have the day program, it's still going. Uh, Toyota came in and built an enormous plant there. So a lot of Japanese families moved to Kentucky and Masaka was the grandmother who came over with her family, had Alzheimer's. Uh, again, how did we keep her feeling purposeful, productive, happy? Well, we asked her to be our Japanese language tutor, and she would teach us Japanese phrases and words. We, we again, this idea of purposeful activity, helping her feel important. Uh, she would demonstrate tea ceremonies to us. And finally, uh, because of her being a Buddhist, we, we did our research and we found a little bronze Buddha. When she was having a bad day, we put the little bronze Buddha in her hand and she would just kind of hold it in her hand, almost like a prayer or a meditation and it worked wonders. Now, again, imagine if we knew nothing about Masaka, we were trying to keep her happy or help her be happy or purposeful, very, very difficult. Harry was a retired dentist from New Orleans. Uh, when Hurricane Katrina hit and wiped out the town, uh, he ended up moving to Kentucky. Again, a younger man moved in with his kids and they realized very quickly that it wasn't PTSD SD from the hurricane, that he had other issues. He was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. I guess what I'd say here is the key message is he's from New Orleans. He was a native Louisiana boy. And you know what he liked? Hot and spicy food, right? And so, you know, imagine he'd moved into an assisted living building. They give him his meatloaf, his chicken, his, his, you know, potatoes, and he stops eating or doesn't eat very much. It wasn't suiting him. But you see, we know his life story like we do with a best friend. We bought the Tabasco sauce, the hot sauce for what, $3.00. And that was a, a way to make him happy. Uh, giving him the shower, you put on uh, Louis Armstrong or some jazz, it relaxes him. You talk about living in Louisiana and suddenly you just take this minute or two to focus on the person over the task and everything goes better. And my mother, Dorothy, uh, here she is in a lovely picture early in her life and the last year or two of her life. Um, my mother had a long tradition. She loved Earl Grey tea with milk. And I have to tell you, 
that probably 90% of the time when my mother, Dorothy, was having a bad day, when she lived in memory care assisted living for three years, when the staff offered her a lovely cup of Earl Grey tea with milk, she would go, ah, oh, heaven, much better than any psych medicine. And it, it worked wonders, right? And so again, as a family member, I made sure I brought in Earl Grey tea. I gave each staff member a little gift box of Earl Grey tea. I brought in some of her teapots. I actually would serve it with my mother when I was there. I, I modeled that this is what I wanted them to do with my mother, and it was tremendous. And, and you know, the message here again is sometimes it just takes 30 seconds to be a little less task-oriented, a little bit more person-centered, and everything goes better. One other quick story, my mother, even though her, her parents were from, uh, from Manchester, she wasn't French-Canadian, her parents were from England. My mother, of course, spoke fluent French, and there was a staff member once who found some old fashioned flashcards, you know, English, French vocabulary cards. And they asked my mother to be their French professor and they would practice English and French language. I went in to visit my mother one day and discovered this delightful activity underway with this caregiver with the flashcards. And my mother said to me, darling, it's so nice to see you, but I'm terribly busy right now. And I'm, I'm terribly busy right now. I'm in class, you'll, you'll have to come back later. <laughs> so I was summarily dismissed. So a few reflections as I begin to wind down my talk here today. Um, I wanna again, thank you for allowing me to be present for you during this time and just share a few other kind of summation thoughts from a couple of my Canadian friends and colleagues I've admired over the years. Some of you may know Yitka Zagola, who's an occupational therapist. She now lives in Cape Breton. I think has a B&B &B and does ceramics. She's a, a brilliant, wonderful writer and has written a number of books in the field if you Google her. Uh, she says, optimal, optimal dementia care involves three elements. A good relationship between the caregiver and the person who has dementia, a safe and nurturing environment, and meaningful activity. So again, simple. Gwendolyn de Geese is a dear friend of mine uh, in Victoria. She lived in Vancouver and a nurse and very, very lovely, lovely soul. Uh, she has a company called livingdementia.com if you wanna check her out. She says, person-centered care is founded on the ethic that all human beings are of absolute value and worthy of respect. And even persons with dementia can lead satisfying and fulfilling lives. Dr. Nori Graham, in fact, I was on a Zoom call with her this morning at 6 a.m. California time. She's a retired, uh, well, I, I don't even know if I wanna say retired. She's such an active volunteer these days, but she has worked as a gero psychiatrist in London. I think it's very charming. The word for gero psychiatry in England is old age psychiatrist, which I always think of, sounds like something out of Sherlock Holmes. But she was a former uh, board chair of uh, the UK Alzheimer's Society, Alzheimer's Disease International. And she says, you know, David, maybe, maybe dementia care isn't quite as hard as we make it out to be. Great dementia care is all about informed love. So I think some really uh, delightful words from Dr. Graham out of London. Now, as I wrap up my presentation formally and we'll transition to Q&A in just a moment, um, remember that picture of Augusta, okay, 51 years old. Now, on the right is Harry, who's only a little bit older than, than Augusta. He was, well, actually, maybe he's about 60 in this picture. Um, but, you know, note the differences. Um, they both have Alzheimer's. Now, we don't really know uh, Augusta's mental status exam scores at this point. It's unlikely, I suppose, but it's possible that Harry actually is more advanced in his dementia than Augusta. We, we don't really know for sure. Uh, but you see, uh, Augusta's had a world where I, I don't think they were deliberately cruel to her, but you know, she did end up in a lunacy asylum and probably didn't have any best friends or good food or good care. And on the right, you see Harry um, had great care, um, friends, family, activity, engagement. They would, even with dementia, get him all dressed up in his beloved hiking gear and go for walks and hikes with him. And you see this best friend's approach um, helped Harry live his life at his best, as opposed to Augusta, who sadly uh, did not have that opportunity. So we, we can, I think, really change the world of Alzheimer's, each one of us, as we, as we adopt this best friend strategy and or as we learn just how to be a more effective care partner for the person with dementia. 
Uh, so a couple kind of end notes here. Uh, I do have a website, bestfriendsapproach.com. You're welcome to check that out. Uh, I know Facebook is maybe not the best uh, place these days, but um, I still have a professional Facebook page. If you type in the word best friends approach on your telephone with the, on, on your app for, for Facebook uh, in the search engine, you can like best friends approach or on your, your phone. Uh, and, and I do send out lots of articles and good information as well. My, my email is very simple, David Troxel at Gmail, and I'm always happy to try to answer whatever questions I have, you, you have. On the right is my newest book with Virginia on the best friends approach to dementia care, which is um, a professional edition on really how to do these kinds of programs in your professional setting. And the little book down kind of on the right is my family guide, A Dignified Life. Uh, and, and that book is for families. And I think the Alzheimer's Society may be buying a few of these books. So perhaps they'll have some in a lending library or things that they can resell for you as well. So thank you very much um, for being part of this discussion. Um, I want to acknowledge my publisher, Best Friends uh, and Health Professions Press, and Daphne's uh, family for letting me utilize her artwork. And I think with that, I'm kind of on my mark almost, and I'm going to toss it over to Andrea, and thank you all for participating. And now the floor is yours for Q&A. David, you are right on the money, uh, exactly the time. There's a, a professional speaker. We do have three or four questions, and I will read them out to you. So the first one, uh, is from Stephen who asks, considering angry, in quotes, versus calm, in quotes, behaviors, is there any research or antidotal suggestions that environment plays a role? Or does the expression or the behavior appear to be random? And, and I'm sorry, the first part of the question was about someone being at home? Uh, no, they're just saying angry behaviors or calm before, that's the descriptor oh, oh. I think they're using. Is there any research that suggests what type of environment or what, what impact sure. environment has? So this is where I think we have to recognize that, you know, the world of dementia in many ways is similar to our world. You know, what might make me angry? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty calm guy, I have to confess, but, you know, waiting in line that's never moving. You know, people who you think aren't telling you the truth. Um, maybe someone who rings your doorbell late at night who startles you or scares you, okay? Some kind of confusion, all right? Um, so, so I guess what I'd say is if you, if you look at someone being angry, you wanna, you wanna just try to understand the broad causes. Uh, and, and, and typically, if we drill down a bit, we might be able to understand perhaps they um, don't really quite know who we are and they're confused. Uh, perhaps we're asking them to do something that they don't feel they can do or is causing them frustration. So I would say environment does matter quite a bit. And, and, and even things like, by the way, maybe there's a window with glare coming in. Glare can actually hurt the older eye. So you have to become a detective. I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that there's uh, there's often a lot of things going on. So if someone's angry about something, ask them why. I mean, you know, start with them. Dad, I can tell you're upset. Why are you upset or what's going on? And he, he may give you some clues. Look for time of day, look for environment. Maybe the grandchildren have just come by and it was overly stimulating, all of those things. Now, now, does someone with dementia get angry conceivably for no reasons at all? It's certainly possible. You know, they may be... Uh, thinking about something, have a delusion, a fixed false idea. Um, there may be issues going on that they're not feeling well. And, and of course, sometimes in my world, pain is a big issue. And also, um, you know, sometimes there, someone in, in a professional setting, you might see someone who maybe has had some substance abuse issues, head injury. Uh, those people can be more volatile. So be holistic. There's not one answer, but I would say a lot of it is environment. A lot of it is how we potentially trigger things accidentally. But could some of it kind of come from a mysterious place? Yes. Okay. And another question is asking you to speak a little bit or provide some information about delusions and suspiciousness. Okay. Or suspicions. A delusion is a fixed false idea. They're very common with dementia. Uh, there are people who kind of believe that there's a psychoanalytic reason that, you know, if, if, if I say you stole my purse, maybe someone did me wrong 25 years ago. I tend to think that the delusions are more because they're confusion of time and place and memory. So 
being very quick, I'll, I'll tell you my all-time favorite delusion story was in Santa Barbara. We had a gentleman who was still being cared for at home with his wife, and his wife called me one day. Santa Barbara was sort of a small town and said, David, I'm in a world of hurt. Can you come by? Well, her husband woke up that morning, and he was convinced that the neighbors had moved the fence in three feet during the night, maybe five feet, to steal his land. He was convinced they'd moved the fence. Now, they hadn't moved the fence. The wife was telling him they hadn't moved the fence. But the more she argued with him, the more he thought, hmm, I think she's in on it. And it was becoming <laughs> a giant calamity, right? So this delusion about the fence, who knows where something like that comes from? But he was pretty convinced. So we ended up going to plan B and saying, you know, uh, let's see, what was his first name? It's going to be a Charlie, Charlie, <clears throat> Charlie. Oh, my gosh, I am so sorry that this might have happened. In other words, we were giving him the benefit of the doubt. You know, sometimes they want us to be on their side. And so you don't want you, you want you don't want to become the bad guy. So by saying, you know, honey, I'm so upset that you're distressed about this fence. Let's look into it. At least you're giving him the benefit of the doubt. The wife, again, trying to make the story short, she said the city's working on it. You know, those bureaucrats. She even hired some people to come out and supposedly measure the, the, the space. She just humored him, went along with this, said we're working and apologized. And would you believe after about three or four weeks, what happened one morning? Poof, the delusion just vanished. So again, wait them out, be empathetic, let them know you're working on it, treat it real. Suspiciousness, you know, um, a little bit different flavor. Uh, identify yourself. Hey, mom, it's me. It's, it's David, your son. Good morning. I know who you are. Well, maybe not. So try your best to, you know, explain, you know, not take things for granted. Sometimes simplifying the environment, you know, if, if the house, if, if grandmother's house is cluttered full of stuff and millions of things everywhere, that can create loss and confusion. Um, so tidy things up a little bit, introduce yourself, explain things. And of course, again, maybe you're paying all of your father's bills, right? You're writing out all of his checks. Is he happy about it? No, he may think you're stealing his money. So this is where, again, you want to, in, in my best friend's approach, we call it having the knack, K-N-A-C-K, knack, the art of doing difficult things with ease. Have your father sign the checks, show him the accounts, have him get a red rubber stamp and stamp paid on all the invoices. You know, understand that he, his suspicions are because he doesn't really understand what's happening. It's not that he really mm -hmm. thinks you're stealing from him. And if you, if you help ask him to help you pay the bills, maybe you're addressing some of that suspiciousness and you can say, thank you, dad. What would I do without you? Oh, great answer. We have a question around COVID and we know how COVID has devastated people living with dementia, primarily because of the isolation. When communication and interaction is primarily over the phone, any ideas regarding how you would approach this, especially when language skills are depleted? Well, certainly it's very tough over the phone. Um, you know, if your family member is able to and you can do a Zoom, maybe someone can help them set that up because that can be very, very helpful. Um, I think it's okay to keep it short. I think, I think lead with your emotion versus content. Oh, mother, you know, I'm so happy to hear your voice. And I remember how, you know, you taught me how to make my first apple pie and I love your apple pie. Give lots of compliments, keep it simple. Um, I think it's okay to maybe, if, if you can send a, a lovely card or postcard for the person, maybe to someone to read with, you know, for your family member when you're on the phone. Um, you know, I, I think just trying to do your best. I think the Zoom piece is good um, mm -hmm. for people, but I think short and sweet, simple messages. I, I will say on Zoom calls, uh, I've had some fun. Uh, one of my friends with his mother will do little games like, mom, I'm trying to make a list of all the cities that you and I visited, uh, you know, what they, we've all lived in as family, because I know we moved 20 times. Will you help me make the list? Or, or even just work Games, you know, it's raining cats and dogs, you know, you know, mom, I'm trying to make a list for the children to do some, would you help me create a list? Would you help me dot, dot, dot is powerful. So have some fun, play some word games, Google, Google trivia. Mom, I'm going to visit San Francisco after, after this is all over. What do you think of when you think of San Francisco? You know, things like that can be helpful. Wonderful. I love your examples. I, they're just terrific. Now I've got a couple of 
more personal questions, perhaps. Uh, do you fear the hereditary factor of dementia? Because you've shared with us about your mom. Yeah, well, kind of yes, kind of no. I, I have to laugh. I think we're all a bit worried about our memory these days. You know, I have this personal theory that in ancient times, people were illiterate. They probably had great memory, <laughs> you know. But now if someone says, David, what are you doing this afternoon? I have to look at my phone and like, what am I doing this afternoon? Um, mm -hmm. Not so much. I'll, I'll tell you, number one is certainly we know that about a third of us will probably end up with dementia. But my mother did have it, get it later in life, you know, well into her 70s. You have a bit more of a risk factor if your family members getting in, in their 50s and 60s. Um, but yeah, it is sobering. Uh, my, my mother, bless her heart, my mother was the healthiest person, exercise, slim and trim, ate salmon, you know, did everything right, and she still got Alzheimer's. Uh, I, I will say that it, that is a worry. Lifestyle factors do matter. I try to lead a, as healthy a life as I can. And, and we do believe, by the way, that these lifestyle factors, you know, Mediterranean diet and, you know, exercise and socialization, having friends, having purpose, it won't necessarily prevent you from having Alzheimer's. But if you do these things, it might give you, it may delay the onset. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think I'm a little bit fearful of it, but I, I just try to be zen about it as well. Yes, thank you, David. And this is sort of related. Um, you know, you've mentioned causes um, of the disease, like heart disease, loneliness, diabetes, in terms of undetected health issues that complicate or impact the development. And the person wants to know, are scientists any closer to narrowing down why some people develop dementia or Alzheimer's and others don't, even though mm -hmm. same, same health factors? So... Our field of knowledge is, is really rapidly advancing. I think that is very, very powerful. Um, what I think the challenge is, is many leading scientists still don't agree on what the root causes of the disease are. You know, the amyloid theory of, of this uh, amyloid protein getting into the brains and you know, causing this sort of ca cascade of, of problems is somewhat under attack. There's lots of different theories going on. I would say that there's growing consensus, which was not accepted even, I think, 10 years ago, there's growing consensus that uh, there are risk factors that are substantial. You know, uh, the, the U.S. Society has a campaign that they kind of kind of goes on and off, but what's good for the heart is good for the head. You know, having, having a good cardiovascular health is, is good for the brain, uh, not using tobacco. Um, uh, you know, being social is positive, uh, eating the Mediterranean diet is positive. So why do some people get Alzheimer's, some people don't? We know that there's uh, genetic factors at work, uh, but there is that mixture of genetics and lifestyle, and we don't totally understand the difference. We, we do know that some people um, have a genetic predisposition to Alzheimer's. There are some people with rogue genes who will get Alzheimer's much younger, but I guess I'm going to dodge your question a little bit. We still don't totally know the answer to that question, but we suspect it's genetics, lifestyle. And of course, they are getting closer. And this is actually a whole different topic. But, but you know, we will be able to diagnose Alzheimer's if we can't already with, with some new things like biomarkers, you know, looking at blood and saliva and spinal fluid, mm -hmm. looking at mm -hmm. genetic testing, looking at early testing. We might in the future be able to say somebody has Alzheimer's disease when they're 40. And mm -hmm. um, you know that would be something in a way, it'd be also disappointing, but you see, we believe that in the future, if they do have better medicines, if you start them quite young, that will be the secret. I don't think we're gonna be able to reverse the damage once someone has full-fledged Alzheimer's disease. Thank you. Now I'm just trying to scan the chat as well because we had some questions come in there. And there's one question there about um, if a dementia person doesn't allow me to provide them with nose spray that they don't like, how much do I push? No one dies from a runny nose, but would it be better if they didn't have to wipe their nose every 30 seconds? Sounds like a very practical right. question. Very practical <laughs> question. Well, you obviously can't force somebody to do something they don't want to do. Um, but, you know, just I think I would I would try to develop a little script around it. You know, mom, I know you don't like this, but the doctor says we must do this. Maybe have the doctor write a prescription. You might create one for yourself that's a, you know, just has water and you made them mom watch, like do yourself and then give her hers. 
you know, to kind of model that. Um, you know, I, I think look at time of day, I, I guess bribery, I, I think I would try you know, the chocolate <laughs> afterwards. But, you know, ultimately, I think you may have answered your own question. If it's a, if it's a giant, you know, wrestling match, you, you probably want to uh, let it go or talk to the doctor about any other options. Uh, one thing I certainly recommend that probably is less of a challenge in Canada, but in the U.S., I, I think there's still a lot of people on way too many medications. You know, why does somebody with Alzheimer's, advancing Alzheimer's, have to be on 18 prescriptions? It, it's kind of ludicrous. So talk to your your pharmacist about what's really necessary. So there may be some other things you could do. Mm -hmm. Well, David, this has been an amazing, amazing after hour and a half, it's flown by. <laughs> um, I want to thank you, David, because as somebody who's worked in daycare for ever, uh, 30 some years, this truly is, you know, a daycare founded approach to care. And it has spread to other other sites and, and other settings. But I want to thank you because we in daycare are often forgotten about. Well, uh, I'm, I'm really glad you, speaking of providing clues and cues, let me just say that I, I love adult day centers. Um, I've, I've not only uh, worked with one in Kentucky, but I was a director of an agency that had three day centers in, on the Central Coast for five years. And I, I think the day programs are, are so therapeutic. They tend to be affordable. Uh, they, they, they're an outing for the person and, you know, families would often say, oh, not quite yet, or I'm not sure, or, I'm not ready. And I have to tell you, almost 100% of the families who would come to my day programs in California or even in Kentucky, after they st started, you know, maybe two afternoons a week or three days a week, they would say, why didn't I do this sooner? It's so great. And the cool thing about a day center, I'm so glad you all sponsor one, is that, you know, what's the harm in trying it? It's not like you're doing surgery or something. You try it, you see how it goes, and, and if it doesn't work. I, I, I can't resist saying that a friend of mine whose mother was so resistant, right? My friend finally kind of got a little bit tricky and realized the mother had poor decision-making. She said, mom, let's go out for ice cream. And they go for a drive. And she says, yeah, mom, I've been wanting to visit this day program for the longest time. I'm going to volunteer there, let's, let's pop in. And she just drove over. Uh, and the staff, of course, knew she was coming and the mom and she walk in and there's a, you know, coffees and pastries and they're chit chatting. And the daughter said, oh, my God, mother, I left the stove on. I've got to run right back home. I'll be back soon. And the daughter ran out the door, <laughs> jumped into her car, drove off, abandoned her <laughs> mother. And she came back about an hour and a half later and the mother was mad. She kind of kind of guessed she'd been conned in a way. But you know what? The mother had a nice time and the mother started the day program. So there you go. You know, yes, sometimes it, it, forgiving is easier to get forgiveness and permission. Yes, it's it's been a certainly it's been a lifesaver for many of our families. And sadly, many of us had to shutter our doors you know, a year ago now. Um, so this is almost we're coming up to the one year anniversary. But I'm pleased to say our three day programs, two of them are open and we're offering six day a week service. So beautiful. And I know uh, chats one of our other um, co uh, community agencies and care first and there's a couple of private agencies too that are doing it. So we know it's vital. Um, we've had to change how we do things um, and fewer people are able to come in but um, it's needed. I cannot thank you enough, David, for your time. And for everyone who's on the line, we have been, David has allowed us to record this session and it will be up on our Alzheimer website for, for you to view and to share because um, this is just wonderful for us to be able to provide this, David. And I do hope that when this is all over, you can come home to Canada. <laughs> well, I, I've, got to, I've got to check out some Tim Hortons, so there you go. One hundred, and they're not the same in the states. Mm. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, and for all of you on the line, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. bye bye. bye, -bye. Thanks, Thanks, Dave. Bye bye. bye, -bye.